In this video lecture, we discuss confidence intervals. So far, we were dealing only with the point estimators. And the point estimator, just to give you an example, was, for instance, x bar, which was used to estimate the true value of the parameter mu, which is the mean. So x bar provides just one single value to estimate the population mean mu. Therefore, we call it a point estimator. Now, this is different to the interval estimation. So the interval estimation will provide an entire interval for the parameter of interest theta, which will have the form theta1, theta2. So theta1 is the low boundary and theta2 is the upper boundary. Thereby, theta1 and theta2 will be some realized value of uh, some random variables uh, theta1, which is a function of your sample, and theta2, which is also a function of your sample. So the, con the confidence interval or the interval uh, estimate for the parameter theta will have generally this form, which states that the probability that the true value of the parameter theta falls between theta1 hat as a low boundary and theta2 hat as the upper boundary corresponds to 1 minus alpha. Thereby, alpha is typically some small value which falls between 0 and 1 and is selected to be either 1%, which is 0 0.01, or perhaps 5%, or perhaps 10%, such that the probability uh, that your true value falls into this uh, interval corresponds to, for instance, 0 0.99 or 0 0.95 or 0 0.90, for instance. So, in other words, you can say that you are 99 or 95 or 90 percent confident that the true value of the parameter theta falls between the, this low and this upper boundary. So you can also write uh, the interval to be of this form. And the notation is also that 100 times 1 minus alpha, again where alpha is 0 0.01 or 0 0.05, or it can be any uh, typically a small value. Just to give you an example, we consider an uh, independent identically a sample of four random variables x1, x2, x3, x4, from normal distribution with mean mu and variance 1. So we can recall that um, for the population mean mu, we used x bar to obtain the point estimator. Now let's say we are interested in uh, obtaining the probability that the true value of the parameter mu will fall in the range between uh, x bar minus 1 to x bar plus 1. So how do we proceed? Just um, a, rem a reminder to you that if we have some random variable um, omega which has normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared and you're interested in some probability for this uh, random variable you always standardize it in the first step. Uh, which means you subtract the mean and divide by standard deviation. So this allows you to obtain the random variable z, which has standard normal distribution, for which we have all values uh, tabulated. So the z uh, table is uh, provided on the last page of your formulas and tables. So knowing that, we can start calculating this probability. So the probability that uh, mu falls between uh, these uh, values can also be rewritten in the following way, right? So from, from here, we can see that you can rewrite it as x bar minus mu being larger than minus 1, whereas from here, you can rewrite it at, as x bar minus mu smaller than 1, which leads to this expression. Now you perform standardization. 
So the mean is already subtracted, so the mean is zero for this random variable. Now you have to divide by the standard deviation. And what is the standard deviation of x bar? Well, we know using the MGF techniques that x bar has this distribution. And it's easy to see that the variance of x bar is given by the variance of 1 over 4, in our case, the sum of xi, i from 1 to 4. Now you can take 1 over 4 out of the variance sign, and now you have, you're using the fact that your sample is independent and identically distributed, and therefore the variance of the sum can be written as a sum of variances, which results in 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 4. Right, which is then given by 1 over 4. So this is the variance. So now if you want to divide your random variable by the standard deviation, which is 1 over square root of 4, and you do perform this on the left and the right hand side of this inequality, then you obtain the following result. So now you're dealing with a standardized random variable z. So this can be in turn rewritten as the probability that z is smaller than 2 minus probability that z is smaller than minus 2. And this probability can be then written in the following form, right? Just using a complement probability. So f, by the way, denotes the CDF of the normal distribution. And once you have that, you can simply resort to the table of uh, the standard normal distribution where all the probabilities are tabulated, where you can use the fact that uh, the CDF at 2, so if you have here standard normal distribution and the value 2 is somewhere here, then on the left from this value you will find 97.725% of all the observations. Okay, so just using this tabulated value and plugging in here, you will get the final result, which basically states that the probability that mu falls into this interval between x bar uh, minus plus 1 is 95.44%. Uh, Let us now discuss a more general way of... Uh, uh, finding a confidence interval. And this uh, method is known as a pivotal quantity method. And a pivotal quantity uh, method requires you to follow the, the, the steps, the following steps. So in the first place you ha have to find the pivot, which is a function of your data x1 to xn with a distribution of this function of the data being free of theta. So once you have that, and you have this uh, function which we denote g, and you know that it follows a certain known uh, distribution, so this is the CDF of some known distribution, so distribution is known, you can also determine the quantas from this distribution. And since uh, this function is a function of theta, but the CDF does not depend on theta. You can uh, you can write the probability that this function falls into the interval between uh, q1 and q2, which are the quantiles of uh, this distribution. Could be, for instance, the 2.5% quantile and the 97.5% quantile of this distribution, then the probability that your uh, pivot falls between these uh, quantiles corresponds to uh, 1 minus alpha, where alpha, in my example, is 5%. So in this case, uh, clearly Q1 is smaller than Q2. Now we assume that uh, the function, the pivot that we have chosen is a monotonic function of theta, such that we can build an inverse function 
of g, which corresponds to the parameter theta. Then you can write the confidence interval of theta depending on whether g is an increasing or decreasing function in the following way. So for g being an increasing function, so if g is increasing, so let's say, let's say it looks somehow like that, and we have here theta 1, and we have here theta 2, and on the y-axis we have the quantiles, so it's uh, q1, which is g of theta 1, and here's q2, which is g of theta 2. Then you can write uh, a confidence interval of theta in the following form. So we have q1 on the left hand side and you have q2 on the right hand side. And in this case theta1 is given by the inverse of the function g evaluated of q1 and the theta2 is the inverse of g evaluated at q2. Now if you have a decreasing function so let's say it looks somehow like that and you have theta 1 here and theta 2 here. So this corresponds to g of theta 1 which is q1 and this value corresponds to g of theta 2 which is q2 then in this case you will have a, to write a confidence interval for theta in the following form where you have q2 to be to enter the low boundary this value here and q1 entering the upper boundary this value here so just to give you an example Let's have a look at the pivotal quantity of the following form. On one of the next slides, uh, I will show that uh, indeed you can use it as a pivotal quantity following uh, this uh, distribution. But for now, just believe me. So we are looking at the uh, pivotal quantity of this form, which you can see includes the parameter theta, and we want to construct the confidence interval for this parameter theta, but the distribution for this entire pivot is known and it's high squared with uh, 2n degrees of freedom. So this is a known CDF and it does not depend on theta, on the parameter of interest. In this case we can use uh, the quantiles from this distribution in order to determine the low and the upper boundaries such that the probability that your pivotal quantity falls in between this quantiles q1 here and q2 here so that's uh, this entire red region here corresponds to 1 minus alpha so if you would say uh, set alpha for instance 1% or 0.01 then this entire red area will cover 95% of the entire distribution. Let's move on to the next example. So let's uh, look at the pivotal quantity and the exponential distribution. So if you have a random sample from the exponential distribution with uh, the parameter lambda and we know the moment generating function for this distribution then we also know that if uh, we are interested in this quantity which is in fact nothing but the sum of your observations 
then it follows the gamma distribution with the parameter n, which is the number of observations in your sample, and the intensity parameter lambda. Then we also know that uh, the MGF of this uh, quantity can be written in the following form. So first we're just applying the uh, definition of the MGF, and then we can write it out as a product of uh, MGFs, and since they're all identical, we're just taking them in the power of n, which then results in this expression where we're using the fact that the MGF of the exponential distribution corresponds to this function. Now let's have a look at this uh, quantity. This is a quantity of interest which uh, we think of using as a pivotal quantity what the MGF of this random variable is. So we can use the property of the MGF which allows us to bring this constant inside the, um, inside the, uh, inside the bracket here which in turn allows us uh, to use the previous result and to write out uh, the MGF of this uh, random variable in the following form, which can also be uh, rewritten using this expression. Then uh, the pivot, this random variable, as we have seen, is a function which depends on the lambda. But if you look at the MGF of this uh, random variable on the previous slide, you can identify the MGF of some known distribution just by using uh, your, for instance, the book of formulas and tables. And you can see that uh, the distribution using the MGF function corresponds to the gamma distribution with these parameters which is in fact the same as the high square distribution with the number of degrees of freedom corresponding to 2n. So you can see that the pivot itself depends on the parameter of interest, but it does follow some known distribution which is free of lambda. And this is the sign that indeed this function uh, 2n lambda x bar can be used as a pivot. So since we know the uh, distribution of uh, the pivot, we can also determine the quantiles, the low and the upper quantile for this distribution. And now we just have to check whether uh, the function we have in mind is an increasing or decreasing function, because uh, it, will, uh, it will allow us to determine whether uh, the low and the upper quantile enter the low or the upper boundary. So, and this function, as you can see, is an increasing function, simply because uh, those are uh, the constants and uh, x bar uh, uh, times uh, lambda is an increasing function uh, of lambda. Thus, we can use the expression on one of the previous slides to write the probability that your pivot falls between the q1 right because it's an increasing function we have q1 here and q2 here corresponds to 1 minus alpha which let's say alpha is 5% then it's a 95% uh, confidence interval for lambda and then you can simply rewrite uh, this confidence interval by dividing the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this inequality by 2n times uh, x bar, which then allows us to write the confidence interval for lambda. Let's have a look at the other example. So we look at the confidence interval for the mean now. So let's uh, suggest that we have uh, independent sample, which is identically distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And uh, we use uh, this notation to denote the sample mean. Then notice that for large number of observations, uh, the central theorem states that the standardized quantity of this form converges in distribution to the standard normal distribution. And you also notice that this will hold for any random variable with finite mean and finite variance, as long as, as, long as you have a lot of observations in your sample. 
So suppose also that um, this sample comes from the population where um, mean is mu, and we know the variance sigma squared. It is quite important that the variance is known because uh, the formula for the confidence interval will change depending on the variance is known or unknown. So in this video lecture, we only discuss the case for the known variance, and uh, during the lectorial, uh, we'll go through some other additional examples of unknown variants as well. So let's find the confidence interval for mu. Well, we know that uh, using the central limit theorem, the x bar is approximately normally distributed with mean corresponding to mu and the variance being sigma squared over n. It is then very simple to think of what the pivot can be. Well, in fact, if you standardize your uh, random variable of interest x bar by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, then you know this uh, uh, quantity has standard normal distribution. So this suggests we can use it, uh, this entire expression as a pivot simply because it does depend on mu, the parameter of interest, but it has some known distribution which is free of mu. So the second step is to decide on whether the chosen pivot, so this function is an increasing or decreasing function in the parameter. Well, obviously, uh, it is a decreasing, of the par decreasing function of the parameter simply because we have minus here, which then suggests that, that um, we will have to have the confidence interval of the form that we have an inverse here of your data x1, xn, evaluated at q2, smaller than mu and the upper boundary will be evaluated at x1, right? You will see in a second that this is exactly uh, what the decreasing function suggests you to do. So now we know that for the standard normal random variable, the probability that we fall between the these quantiles, which correspond to z value here at alpha over 2, which is the region on the left tail of the distribution, and this value is z1 minus alpha over 2, so again this region here corresponds to alpha over 2, then this entire probability, so the white region in between this and that uh, bars corresponds to 1 minus alpha. Okay, and then since we are using the pivot water quantity of this form, you can uh, rewrite this inequality with respect to mu, so that you have the parameter of interest in the center and everything else will be placed on the right or the left uh, hand side of this inequality, which, uh, as you can see, results in the confidence interval for the parameter. And uh, obviously, the upper boundary will contain Q1, whereas the lower boundary will contain Q2. So thus, you can see the final results, uh, result uh, leads to this following expression, which says that uh, the, interval interval, the interval estimate for mu is given by x bar plus minus the standard deviation times the quantile from uh, the standard normal distribution. Here we also use uh, the fact that uh, standard normal distribution is symmetric. So... In fact, you can see that uh, this value here is nothing but minus the lower quantile, okay? So those two values are of the same magnitude, but uh, having a different sign. So we call this interval an approximate confidence interval for mu, given the known population variance. Well, and why do we say uh, approximate interval? Uh, we simply say approximate interval because uh, we had to resort to central limit theorem in order to 
assume that X bar is asymptotically normally distributed. So obviously, if you are given uh, the case that your data is normally distributed and independent identically uh, distributed, then you do not necessarily you do not have to say that the confidence interval is an, is an approximate confidence interval. Uh, the final note is that for the standard normal distribution, the following quantiles are uh, typically very frequently used, and uh, I suggest that at least the fifth percentile at the one-sided and two-sided you're memorized by heart. It will save you lots of time to look up the standard normal table. What does that mean? So for the two-sided case that we used uh, so far, it suggests that if you look at alpha over 2 on the left and on the right tail of the distribution, so basically uh, you have here z alpha over 2 and 1 minus z alpha over 2, then this value, so this, er this uh, value here is 1.96 and this value here is minus 1.96. Right? So uh, for the case if alpha is equal to 5%. So you cut 2.5% of observations on the left and on the uh, right uh, tail of the distribution. So you end up having 95% area in between these bars. And the quantile then corresponds to 1.96%. If, however, you look uh, to the one-sided, so in the one-sided scenario, you cut off the entire alpha on the only one tail of the distribution. Okay, so this corresponds to now 5% rather than 2.5% as in the two-sided scenario. So it was 2.5 here. So in, in this case, Still, you have 1 minus alpha on the left uh, hand side of this distribution, but well, obviously this value here changes, and now it corresponds to 1.645. Uh, the other two values for alpha corresponding to 1 and 10% are also useful, but you don't have to memorize them. Now, now the final note is that um, all the above gives uh, the confidence interval for the mean when uh, the population variance is known and uh, when it is only an approximation for which the approximation improves with increasing sample size. And whenever we say that uh, we can use it approximation by uh, the increasing sample size, we mean that uh, the sample size is reasonably large and we use as a rule of thumb n greater than 30. So in other words, we can use the confidence interval for the mean that we derived uh, above for the scenario when the variance is known and when you can uh, approximate the distribution using the central limit theorem for the case when the number of observations is large. If the number of observations is small or the variance is unknown, you will have to uh, use the t-distribution that will be discussed during the lectorial.